गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम बैक टू फोर्थ सेशन ऑफ इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार ऑन पीडियाट्रिक्स एयरवे प्रॉब्लम्स टुडे वी हैव अनदर स्टार्टेड प्रो स्टार्टेड प्रोग्राम ऑन एन इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक दैट इज रिक्रेंट रेस्पिरेटरी पॉपुलमर्टोसिस दिस इज वन कंडीशन वी कैन नॉट वेट इवन दो वी आर नॉट सपोज्ड टू बी डूइंग इलेक्टिव सर्जरी दिस पर्टिकुलर कंडीशन डेफिनेटली डिमांड्स इमरजेंसी मैनेजमेंट and the problem is we cannot do a tracheostomy in this cases i think we have uh, a exemplary or extraordinary faculty today and being moderated by none other than uh, dr e v raman sir i think we are going to discuss this matter at length i welcome dr raman sir uh, to uh, take over and moderate the session uh, today's program welcome sir good evening uh, thank you very much for to you for all joining us uh recurrent respiratory papillomatosis is one of those things which uh, leads to a lot of dejection as we treat this condition affecting small children and putting placing an extensive burden on the family and the caregivers and we don't have proper solutions to the to this problem even now so to debate this uh, problem of recurrent respiratory papillomatosis we uh, have a very distinguished panel here and uh, as you know in the past episodes also we've had people who have personally worked in this area coming and sharing their experience with us not just mere textbook knowledge so going ahead i had a um, a little bit of a, a search to find out who is passionate about this who's been uh, working in this area so that we can learn from them and we have assembled a very distinguished panel and more important than that we have a two way communication because our in our audience we have excellent uh, extremely experienced uh, uh, doctors who will also share with us but to demystify the whole thing we also have two more or three more people one is of course um uh, dr deepak mehta who will be joining us from texas children's hospital then we have kartik balakrishnan from stanford Uh, associate professor in stanford who's another uh, academic uh, uh, orient academically oriented pediatric otolaryngologist with the right credentials and we have also dr bikram choudhury from all india institute of medical sciences jodhpur to make us understand what the experts speak in a more lucid manner we start off the proceedings with uh, dr nupur whom uh, i've been following she's a very accomplished laryngologist passionate has organized numerous webinars i had the pleasure of attending her meetings and uh, who else but her to kind of uh, tell us about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis all that we want to know we follow that up with uh, dr kapil sikha who's going to talk about the more devastating um, tracheal part of the uh, disease and we have dr jagdish chinappa following that i'll introduce uh, both of them later uh, nupur works in the bombay hospital she is the head of the laryngology services and she's an oncoming if i can do a little marketing for her oncoming excellent uh, uh, webinar with international pop, uh, participation i'm sure most of you who are interested in this particular topic and anything laryngeal would should register for that and benefit from the knowledge of the wisdom of the uh, distinguished faculty that she has assembled over the years uh, with this without much ado i request dr nupur nirulkar to uh, begin her talk thank you thank you so much dr raman it's indeed a pleasure to be here today uh with all of you all in this continuing airway symposium uh so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen yeah please um so uh it comes up as who can share and then uh what do i do continue uh So the screen says that who can share. So I've said all participants, yeah. but it's not letting me move ahead. Oh, you 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 are a co-host, ma'am, already. Uh, I suppose I let me check on that. No, I don't think so. Okay, let me withdraw. I don't. And yeah, I am a co-host. It does say co-host though over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. why is it not letting me share my screen? Oh, I think because you have not stopped your share, maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't have to stop. No, I don't have to stop. It will overtake. Go, just say go ahead. 
but there's no option of go ahead uh, okay i'll stop share now yeah, you do please yeah let me try now okay it's asking the same question who can share so i'll just say only host and let me try now i think that only host works okay i think maybe we should be on now we got it so what i have to say is only host not participants and i think maybe you are getting my share screen now yeah perfect yeah, yeah. all right excellent so um laryngeal papillomatosis all about it i don't think we'll cover in 25 minutes but i'm going to try and cover whatever i think are the salient features and of course as dr raman said we've got an interactive session at the end of our talks today so i look forward to that also uh, i work in bombay hospital in mumbai uh let's get down to what is papilloma i understand there may be people who are attending who are very senior and also those who are residents so i've kind of kept a mix of the material that i'm sharing uh, and papilloma is a disease where there is a virally induced epithelial proliferation which is affecting the respiratory tract that we do know it is also the commonest laryngeal tumor in children so uh, when does papilloma take place we all know that there's juvenile onset and there's adult onset papilloma so when do we say something is juvenile onset there is one school of thought which believes anything under a 5 years would be juvenile onset there's another school of thought which believes up to adolescence can be considered as juvenile onset and then everything beyond that is adult onset and in the adult onset now it has been shown by research that there's not one peak but there are two peaks one peak is between 20 to 40 years and another peak does take place at around 64 years so we know that human papilloma virus 6 and 11 are the incriminating agents so to speak most of the time and 11 is more aggressive especially in children and 6 can be more aggressive sometimes in the adults now 16 and 18 hpv 16 and 18 are uncommon but when they are present we have to be vigilant about malignant change in the papilloma also it's interesting to know that when you send a tissue for viral typing and if it comes back as a no type that also may be associated actually with malignant conversion more often than not so how does this transmission of the juvenile onset papilloma take place typically it's a vertical transmission it's thought over the years that okay there is a peripartum transmission of the virus from the infected mother but the problem is that we've seen that c section does not completely protect the child from juvenile onset when so then that does not hold true if the theory of peripartum transmission is considered also the second point is one out of several hundred children only uh, who are born to hpv positive mums will develop juvenile onset so again i don't think we clearly understand exactly about the vertical transmission the second theory which has been proposed by kashima ayol is that the first born vaginally delivered child of a teenage mother a young mother is more likely to develop juvenile onset papilloma and thirdly the cord blood may be a factor of transmission as far as the adult papillomas are concerned it's more of a horizontal transmission maybe orogenital or activation of a latent virus sometimes laser plumes or instruments if you're in the healthcare industry the hpv virus anyway has an affinity definitely for the epithelium because it is the basal the basal epithelial cells which are proliferating so therefore the virus is going to be infecting this basal layer of the epithelium and the hpv integrates in this basal epithelial layer at the epithelial transition zones that means where stratified squamous epithelium is meeting columnar epithelium and the virus also has a propensity to enter when there is traumatized epithelium so when we perform a tracheostomy not only are we causing trauma to the epithelium there is a junction now of stratified squamous epithelium with columnar epithelium and therefore there's a double propensity for the virus to get affected in the tracheal area and therefore you can have tracheal spread as far as the histopathology is concerned it's a very classical fronds of stratified squamous epithelium with a 
a core of which is vascular, a fibrovascular core, which is covered with these exophytic proliferations. There is no differentiation in the histopathology, whether it's a child or an adult, the histopath is going to be completely the same. The other interesting factor is that very often one sees coilocytes. Coilocytes are vacuolated cells with clear cytoplasmic inclusion. And these signal the presence of the viral infection. So I'll show you, this is the zoom of an adult papilloma of one of our patients. And you can see this central fibrovascular core, and you can see all the stratified squamous epithelium. And these all vacuolated cells, these are the coilocytes. One more slide, this is a pediatric papilloma, and you can see all the coilocytes, which are suggesting that there's viral infection. So what are the sites of involvement in papilloma? 95% of the time, the larynx is going to be involved, but not all 95% of the times is it only the larynx. So isolated laryngeal involvement is 52%. Laryngotracheal involvement is around 26%. And then you can have extra laryngeal involvement in 32% of the cases, commonly in the oropharynx, nasopharynx, mouth, and then, of course, bronchi and lung parenchyma, which Dr. Kapil is going to be talking to us about today. How does the presentation take place in the children? It's more aggressive than in the adults. Why is that? Maybe what has been postulated is there may be an immature immune system in the children. Typically, the child would come with hoarseness and can present a little late because small children can't exactly complain when there's a slight change in their voice. So unfortunately, occasionally it may happen that the hoarseness may go missed and there may be then an inspiratory or even a biphasic strider with an insidious history and that's when the parents would bring the child to you. Or in our practice, especially in Bombay Hospital, we are often get children who are already diagnosed cases of juvenile onset and Unfortunately, sometimes they've also been tracheostomized and they are referred to us for further management. There may or may not be associated globus dysphagia cough. And there's a paper by Sanjiwaji in 2016 published in the laryngoscope, which suggests that there's no relationship between GERD and RRP. But there are some uh, authors who feel there is some kind of a correlation. How do we diagnose a child? So when a child comes maybe one or two year old with history of hoarseness, with maybe some dyspnea on exertion or inspiratory strider, what do we do with this child? Do we give the child general anesthesia straight away? No. Basically we do a SpO2 monitoring to get an idea of what the saturation levels are. We then like to take the child into our laryngoscopy suite and we wrap the child in a blanket. You can consider it mummifying the child, wrapping the arms and holding the legs down. Uh, and it's actually the small children who allow the procedure of laryngoscopy very easily. It's a six to 10 year old, which is a very difficult kind of age because they're strong enough to kick around. After 10 years of age, children are typically quite cooperative. So under, under six years, we don't really have too much of a problem. And what you do need is a pediatric, either flexible laryngoscope or flexible bronchoscope, but a pediatric one, ideally with a diameter, external diameter of 2.8 millimeters. And what we were doing is just spraying a little one spray of 4% lignocaine in each nostril prior to the scopy. But now in the COVID era, we are not using any sprays whatsoever in any laryngoscopies because even spraying is considered to be aerosol generating. So we, what we do is just a little drop of lignocaine jelly is put on the scope itself over the distal four or five centimeters. And that's it, no sedation, nothing. And you have a look at the larynx. And the diagnosis of, of papilloma per se is clinically very apparent where you see these fronds and this warty kind of a look. And of course, you have to do a histopathological confirmation, but the look is very, very typical. Now, the uh, staging of papillomas, there are two uh, different ways one could do it by the Durkay called Coltrera system, which is a uniform staging a worksheet for assessment of papillomas, where you can go by the clinical and anatomical parameters, but there are 25 subsites. Uh, so it may get a little bit cumbersome to do in your busy practice. The other classification system is the Dickers, which is just grade one, two, and three. 
So basically, grade one is sessile growths, which may be unifocal or multifocal. And let me show you an example. So this is a grade one of Dickers. You can see on the left focal fold, it's like a carpet of growth. So it's a sessile growth. It's unifocal over here. And here you see in another patient, this is an NBI picture. Over here, you can see that the carpet of growths are multifocal. Both of these, unifocal and multifocal, are grade one in the Dicker system. Then we have the grade two, where you have an exophytic kind of growth, but only a single frond would be grade two. And supposing you had multiple such fronds, as you can see over here, then that is a grade three. So when we have a classification, classification system which everyone follows there can be a sort of a grading pattern which everyone works with so i'd like to first just summarize the comparison between juvenile and adult onset typically you can consider it at under adolescence or under five years depending on how you want to take it adult onset is over adolescence and we see the second peak at 64 years. Males and females are equal in juvenile onset, but there's a classical male preponderance in the adult onset. And typically the juvenile onset, according to Kashima, are the firstborn teenage mother vaginal delivery and adult onset is more of an orogenital route. Very aggressive for juvenile, not so aggressive for adult onset. HPV 11 more aggressive for juvenile and HPV 6 more aggressive for adult onset. Always try to avoid a tracheostomy. It doesn't really come into play so much in the adult onset. And what I've put here is that in adult onset, consider microflap excision when possible. And I'll come to that a little later. Always respect the anterior commissure. In the adult onset, you also have the opportunity of trying various office laser procedures mm -hmm. under local anesthesia. So the hemoangiolytic lasers, be it the PDL laser or the KTP laser or the blue laser. And so you avoid the general anesthesia then. So we are moving towards management of papilloma now. The first thing you want to do when you've seen, when you are seeing the patient for the first time, is you want to evaluate the entire airway. You also want to document this. So it should not happen that you miss a tracheal or a bronchial or an oropharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal papilloma when it was present, because then the second time the child comes to you, you don't know if you've, if you've not documented earlier whether this is a new development or whether it was always present. So document. Biopsy for histopathology is a must the first time. Would you do a biopsy every time you're operating? Not necessary. If you're operating on a child four times in a year or five times in a year, you don't have to do a biopsy every time. But you must do interval biopsies because we know the papilloma pathology may change. There may be dysplasia, there may be malignant transformation. So every third surgery is not a bad idea to go ahead and do the histopathology. If your institute in your city has the facilities, definitely get an HPV subtyping because you know if there is a no type, if there's a 16, 18, then your antennae are up. So that's something important. As far as the surgery is concerned, there are three ways of tackling the problem. All of the ways you're basically debulking it. But when the papilloma is very extensive, like it is very often in juvenile onset, you would probably want to do a debulking with microdebriders because microdebriders allow for very quick and efficient debulking. And in, when you're using a laryngeal microdebrider blade, you can have two varieties. You have the tricut and the skimmer. So for people who may not have been exposed to this, think of it as when you're doing mastoid surgery and you've got a cutting burr and you've got a diamond burr. So a cutting burr is like a tri-cut blade and a diamond burr is like a skimmer blade. So it just skims the surface more gentle. Uh, skimmer, the thinnest size you can get of the Zomed is 2.9 millimeters and tri -cut would be a 3.5 millimeters. So that would be the first thing you will do is the debulking. Uh, the second thing you could do, if you have an adult onset papilloma, as I mentioned earlier, very often adult onset, like you see in the screen on the left-hand side, there may be small little fronds. Then you can do either laser-assisted or cold steel microflap excision of each and every frond. So microflap does not mean that you elevate a flap and always keep it. Here, the disease is epithelial. There's no question of keeping that area of the epithelium. So you elevate the papillomas as a flap and excise that flap completely. 
And finally, you can decide to do a laser or a coblator ablation uh, following infiltration. Infiltration is very useful to bulk up the SLP. And this can be done in the carpet growths, you know, which are just like a flush carpet to the vocal fold. You can do a laser ablation. Uh, the idea in all of these surgeries is that you want to remove the diseased epithelium, which has papilloma in it, but you do not want to remove the epithelium, which is normal. The normal mucosa may be infected with HPV, but you don't want to excise what doesn't have the papillomatous growth on it. Furthermore, you don't want to go in depth more than what the basement membrane is. We know the viral replication is taking place in the basement membrane. You don't want to go into the SLP. You definitely don't want to go into the ligament. When you do that, you, you are giving a tract for the papilloma to follow you. And then the papilloma will also go into the ligament and then you have a greater chance of infiltration and possibly even malignant transformation. So the principles of surgery are, when you do the surgery, you can remove everything, but definitely keep one side anterior commissure disease present so that a web does not form. Do not give these patients of uh, surgery where you've done so much, uh, created so much raw area, any kind of voice rest. You don't want a web to form at any cost. I'm going to show a very small edited surgery. A three-year-old child, red rubber tube in C2, papillomas of the left vocal fold. We are palpating with a flap elevator, the right vocal fold. We are using a microdebreeder, Zomed microdebreeder now, uh, and we are performing the debulking. Now we're using a AccuBlade of the CO2 laser system. You see the red AccuBlade on the left-hand side near the red rubber tube. Infiltration is what's being performed now, and you see the disease coming out from the ventricle. When you infiltrate, it brings the disease out. So it's a very, very useful tool to use, not only for bulking the SLP, but for making disease apparent. Uh, we can remove disease from one anterior commissure, but we must keep disease intact on one side at least. This blue picture you see every now and then is because occasionally I use the uh, spectra A or B light. Now we've taken the tube out. Why do we take it out? Because we want to see the interarytenoid area. We want to have access to the arytenoids so that we can not only access that area, we can operate on that area. And then you're done with the surgery and the tube would go back in and you're ready to extubate the patient. Now I just want to uh, over here talk a little bit about safety today because when we are using the micro debrider, and we are using it for papilloma and we are working in a COVID situation, nothing can be more dangerous because it's a powered instrument in the presence of virus. So we really do have to protect ourselves and all the other healthcare workers also in the OR. So of course we know negative pressures, what is an ideal situation, many of us don't have that. So what you see on your screen right now are various types of powered air purifying respirators. So this would be a level three protection. So what you see on the right hand side of your screen is what is an Irilic Ultra Hood PAPR, which is actually made in Bangalore. So we've got it from there. So you see the HEPA filters on my waist on the back over here. And so the sound of the HEPA filter stays restricted in this area. And then you're being fed the pure air through your hood. So this is a nice system. The other system you see on the left hand side of your screen is when the HEPA filter is on the hood itself. This is a pure flow PAPR uh, marketed in Mumbai. Now this is useful because it's very compact. Everything's on the helmet. There's nothing around your waist. But the problem I face with this is that there's a 30 dB sound in my ear when I'm operating. And secondly, I find that one kilo 300 gram weight on my head a little bit too much but these are two systems available we have in our uh, voice clinic and for our surgeries and i would encourage all of you all who are doing this kind of surgery to please consider uh, purchasing one of these uh, so here we land up in a situation, a patient referred to you who has got papillomas. Uh, here you can see them on the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis, but unfortunately this patient has also developed a quite a large web. Maybe a Cohen's type 2 web has developed and there's some papillomas you can see on the right hand side in the subglottis too. So this is a situation you want to avoid, but when it's present, do you operate on the web or not? 
Well, ideally, because we know traumatized epithelium has a propensity to attract the HPV. So therefore, maybe we remove all the papillomas, wait till the disease becomes a little bit quiet, quiescent, and then attack the web. And if necessary, if the patient feels that the voice is serviceable, they don't really want to change, leave it alone. Web is never something you want to operate on unless it is absolutely necessary. So regardless of the tools being used, whether it's CO2 laser, whether it's a hemoangiolytic laser like the KTP or the pulse dye, whether you're using a microdebrider or coblation, the principles of your surgery remain constant. Holler did publish a prospective cohort study where he compared vocal outcomes in 11 children operated with CO2 laser or microdebrider, and he demonstrated a better vocal outcome with the debrider group. This was a 2009 study. In papillomas, the big challenge is tracheostomy. You really don't want to do it. Why? It's associated with 50% chance of tracheal disease by Kashima study of 93. Uh, if there is a trachea done, you want to decannulate it at the earliest possible time. Supposing a child doesn't have a tracheostomy, will there be no tracheal disease? No, not so. According to Strong, 17 to 26 percent of the children still can have tracheal disease. And according to Wise, 5 percent can have bronchopulmonary. But this is a much smaller percentage. According to Durkay in a study performed in 1995, 14 uh, percent of tracheostomies that were performed were on children. Uh, of papilloma. 70% uh, of patients who had HPV 11 needed a tracheostomy according to Rimmel. The other complication of course is the multiple anesthesias because of the multiple surgeries. On an average it's four a year, total 20 for a patient. This is average international rates I'm giving you. So you need to counsel the parents of the child right at the beginning is going to need multiple surgeries, there's going to be an expense involved. They have to understand what they are going to be dealing with. Anterior commissure, we've already addressed. Let's talk a little bit about malignant transformation. Typically, it's say three to five percent of the times there may be a malignant transformation, and it's described in children with tracheobronchial pulmonary involvement as compared to the adults where you can get laryngeal transformation itself into malignancy. Uh, now, when you have the no type, I also mentioned that there, there may be a higher chance of getting the malignant transformation. There were two researchers who published this, Dickers in 2016 and Omland in 2014. In our institute, we've had two cases of malignant transformation over the last 13 or 14 years. I'm showing you a girl who had been operated three times and then referred to our center. She had history of the first papilloma at 15 years of age. So would you call it juvenile or adult? I tend to think of juvenile. She also, when she came to us with this history of three surgeries, had a unilateral immobile vocal fold. Now, it's very, very unusual in papilloma to have an immobile vocal fold unless a joint fixation due to anesthesia or surgery has taken place or you think of infiltrating lesion. But when she was with us, we operated on her four times and she it was only when she was 21 years of age that she had a malignant conversion where the disease had become a very kind of um, uh, spread into, indurated and spread into the uh, deeper layers. So you see, this was her papilloma on the upper left-hand side of your screen, which then later on became into invasive squamous cell. And you can see that we performed a total laryngectomy on her, how aggressive the disease was. And it's been over six years. Now I'm going to show a video of her. She's a very spunky young lady. We had to radiate her, of course. So she has the skin changes post-radiation. And she is touch wood doing well. Is there a remission in puberty? Some reports do suggest it. We haven't seen it really. It's been postulated that an alteration in the immune system at puberty may be responsible for a remission. Uh, but in our experience, we haven't really seen this in our patients. It's uh, kind of, you know, very unpredictable. And I won't talk about the vaccination because we have somebody who's going to be giving us a lot of information about this. But don't be using the cervix, which has only 16, 18. Definitely Gardasil or now you have even more... Uh, uh, types which can be, uh, you know, 
given. So what vaccines basically in principle are not therapeutic, but there, uh, there is some studies, there's one by Pauletta et al, which suggests that an increased number of antibodies against HPV following this uh, Gardasil may prevent new papilloma formation. So uh, there are other modalities of treatment, Cidofovir and Avastin are two treatment modalities which are quite popular now for patients who need more than six procedures in a year. Cidofovir is an antiviral, Avastin is a monoclonal antibody, and uh, both of them can be injected intralesionally. Cidofovir is a maximum of one milligram per kg body weight, but you can have cumulative toxicity. There may be dysplastic changes. It's not available uh, in India, and it's extremely expensive, about 95,000 for a while. Avastin is cheaper from 12 to 30,000, not only can you give it intralesionally, but you can give it uh, also as IV, five to 10 milligram per kg body weight. But don't consider this for people who don't need surgeries more than five to six times in a year because everything has some side effects. Some people do like to give oral indole 3 carbonol. I do ask my patients to have a lot of cruciferous vegetables instead. I don't have any clinical experience with the interferon alpha 2A group, which has been recommended. Healy did not show any benefit with it. And then you have a vitamin A, acyclovir, but acyclovir is more for the HCV. And you have photodynamic therapy. Also, I think a lot of our senior colleagues use Thuja, but I don't think uh, it was very effective because it's not popular anymore. And some people uh, in the West are even giving a type of Japanese mushroom extract, uh, AHCC compound, uh, which is supposed to inhibit the HPV. Uh, so just two slides to show that we did a retrospective analysis of our papilloma cases on six years. This was with Ranjita, my fellow. Ranjita Krishnan. And the idea was to just figure out whether we're getting more adult or juvenile onset and what was the viral type and correlation. And surprisingly, our study showed we had 71% of adult onset and 29% juvenile. So is this a changing trend because of, uh, you know, virus uh, related diseases getting more popular? And typically, the mean number of surgeries done in the children were over six and in the adult group were less than two. Um, this was a you know, presentation of a location with the glottis only being 73%, et cetera. Uh, to come to the genotyping, we were able to do the um, quantitative PCR test in 24 of these 53 patients that we had. 17 had HPV type 6. Two of them had HPV type 16. One was HPV type 11. We didn't have any 18. And we had four which were no type. And in studying the malignant transformation, because we had two in our Bombay Hospital series, one was a no type and one was the HPV 16. All the HPV 6 were just squamous papillomas with no dysplasia. So what does the future hold for us? Immunomodulation, I think. Um, maybe uh, the studies being done on genetic predilection in parents may help us. It would be wonderful to have a safe and specific antiviral, but till we get that, what should our aim be? to have a safe airway, to improve the patient's voice, and to mitigate the disease, the distal spread of the disease. Uh, and this should be done with the least number of surgeries. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and I'd also like to invite you, and thanks for Dr. Raman also to introduce uh, this 14th uh, workshop on phonosurgery webinar with all of you. Uh, all the details are available on phonosurgeryworkshops.com. It promises to be a very exciting day and we are inviting e-posters, which are going to be uh, an award e-poster session. So please take this as a personal invitation from me. And thank you so much. I'm going to stop my uh, screen share now. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions at the end of the session. Um. Thank you very much, Nupur, for that wonderful exposition. I knew we expected it, and uh, you've, you've just met not only our expectations and gone beyond that. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, we have uh, three of our panelists here, expert panel, uh, Dr. Deepak uh, from Texas. Can uh, somebody unmute uh, Deepak's uh, yeah. uh, audio, please? Prala? Yeah, yeah, done, sir. Done. Deepak, any quick comments on, uh, incidentally, Dr. Deepak Mehta is from the Texas Children's Hospital. He's head of the Hero Digestive Center and the major supporter of our airway surgery program, which has been going on for years. No words to express our gratitude to him, and he's also committed to medical education. Deepak, your quick comments. 
Thanks, Dr. Raman. Um, I'll just make one, one comment about Prahlad. Prahlad and me go a long time back. He was my senior in medical school. Oh, so, that's news. <laughs> yeah. And okay. he was, he was, um, he was a pioneer at that time. We were looking up to him even then uh, as a medical student. He was my senior, couple of years senior. But even at that time, he was, he was uh, someone we all looked up to. So, uh, thank you, Prahlad, for putting this together. Yeah, yeah. Most Presentation right. was excellent. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. The main thing now I can say is um, within U.S. there's a multi trial going on, uh, looking at Avastin, and overall talking to all the different centers, uh, there is a lot of good response from Avastin. So uh, a lot of people are more moving towards Avastin. Uh, fever was uh, very much in use. It's still being used in a lot of centers who are not part of the trial. And it shows a fairly a fairly good result, but we uh, it was not as good as Avastin. So there is more and more trend towards using Avastin now. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, uh, let's welcome Dr. Karthik Balakrishnan. Can you unmute Dr. Karthik? Yeah, unmuted. Uh, he has to unmute himself. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Done, done. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good morning. Um, we have the honor and pleasure of having Dr. Karthik Balakrishnan, and I didn't formally introduce him. He uh, was with the Johns Hopkins, where he did his early studies, and subsequently from Cincinnati. And he's very active. I see a lot of his publications, including the IPOG with the consensus statement. And he probably give, comes with very wise counsel on most of the problematic issues, especially issues like recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Thank you, Karthik, for joining us and your comments, please. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Um, I appreciate the chance to be here and, and learn from all of you as well. Um, I guess my main view on papillomatosis is that most of these treatment approaches have been poorly studied. Most of the reports on them are case studies. Um, and so we really don't know why and if and how many of these approaches work. And so we resort to a lot of surgical intervention because we have nothing better. My hope is that as things are better studied, uh, a lot of this will transition to medical care. Um, Doug Seidel and I are part of a group that's trying to standardize the approach to uh, systemic avastin treatment. But you know, systemic avastin treatment is currently a sort of a last resort. So hopefully as this gets systematized and better studied, it can be not only a last resort or rescue medication, but something that we can use as a standard treatment and hopefully obviate the risks of glottic scarring and so on uh, that, that we just heard about. So. Thank you. Um, Bikram, Bikram Chaudhary is uh, the other panelist from uh, Ames, Jodhpur. Welcome, Bikram. And share your thoughts, first comments on Nupur's talk or uh, whatever you want to tell us. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, sir. So I have uh, basically a couple of points. One is that it seems that uh, cesarean section per se does not actually protect the children against uh, juvenile RRP. It's surprising, but it's true that uh, it's been found that the risks to these children, even without a vaginal delivery, are exactly the same as they are with the cesarean section. Secondly, sir, what I've noticed is that the number of children who used to come to us with uh, tracheostomies, with bulging num large number of papillomas from the tracheostoma, this number has reduced tremendously over the last few years. In fact, in the early part of this century, I mean, in this, uh, the last decade, we used to see this very, very commonly, but probably with the availability of flexible bronchoscopes and availability of better diagnostic modalities, uh, the young people are now investigating before they are doing the tracheostomies and avoiding tracheostomies much more in these cases of recurrent uh, of papillomatosis, leading to us getting cases which are actually not in such a bad shape and we can actually do something about it. Thirdly, that uh, there's a, with this, uh, uh, Dr. Nehrukar mentioned about narrow band imaging, she showed an image as well. It's extremely important if it's available to perform that, especially in certain cases of adult onset uh, papillomatosis, where it's sometimes that stippled appearance, which, can, which is visible, 
uh, on the narrow band imaging can tell us that it's not something like uh, it's more like a carpet variant we're dealing with rather than a simple case of GERD. So that's all I have to say about this. No, good. Thank you. Your talk has been appreciated all around, and thank you so much for that. And without much ado, we go to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Kapil Sikka from the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And I remember him talking to uh, me a couple of years back uh, about the work they were doing. So I reconnected with him and I wanted uh, somebody who's doing, you know, shop floor medicine. That means working in the same area to share thoughts with us. And uh, going back to Nupur, she had also talked about uh, the papilloma registry. I think this is a forum where towards the end, maybe we should discuss that and see whether we can do that. And um, uh, Kapil, the field is yours. You can uh, start. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, hope my screen is visible to all. Yes. So, uh, over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'll be talking on the topic that I don't really love. Uh, these are the type of patients that uh, uh, <clears throat> we all don't like to manage too much because uh, uh, they are difficult, uh, they are uh, costly affair, uh, they are uh, uh, real challenge both for patient as well as for uh, the treating physician. So uh, before I uh, proceed with my talk, uh, my sincere acknowledgement to all my colleagues in the department. It's not a one man show. We all work together and uh, some of the slides and presentation in my presentation and some of the patients and some of the uh, research aspects, they are taken from uh, uh, the research presentations or research projects from uh, my colleagues, Professor Alok Thakkar, Dr. Chirom Amit Singh, Dr. Hitesh Verma and uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. So while uh, Sir had discussed with me about this topic and I was just going through uh, some of the literature, uh, which we do like to read just before we are uh, making the uh, presentations, I came across this uh, physician-based uh, survey on American Academy of Pediatric Otolaryngology. It was published long back. Experience with recurrent respiratory papillomatosis and use of adjuvant therapy. And uh, uh, it's not surprising uh, that it is considered an immense public and personal hazard. If you look at the points that uh, came out of uh, this particular study, one out of five patients will require more than 40 procedures in their lifetime. And that's a big number. We have patients who are under our follow-up who has got more than 150 procedures in their lifetime. They have grown up and only thing that they have seen through life is the surgery for RRP. As ma'am had uh, very nicely mentioned, it's a potentially malignant disease. It is a potentially lethal disease. And uh, if you look at this survey, 50% of respondents, it's the respondents who actually deal with pediatric airway, they have seen at least one mortality due to RRP in their career, uh, as is being discussed and will be discussed by uh, the future panelists and future speakers. Uh, we are still far from ideal treatment. We are still far from perfect treatment. We have tried everything right from BCG revaccination to cimetidine to suppression of acid reflux to nowadays avastin, but we still don't know what is the most ideal treatment for treatment of RRP. Uh, this thing has already been discussed uh, that there are two types, the juvenile onset and adult onset, and ma'am had very clearly mentioned that it's actually a trimodal disease, if not a bimodal disease as it was thought initially and you have got three peaks at 7, 35 and 64 years. If you look at our experience on viral typing with linear array genotyping and viral load estimation by RT-PCR, our results are a slightly different. I think it's a play of statistics. Uh, more frequent in our Indian subcontinent uh, and Indian scenario is probably the HPV-11 uh, subtype in almost 58% of cases and almost 41% had HPV-6 uh, viral infections. And if you look at HPV-11 versus HPV-6, we did not have a significant difference in DER-K score in subjects who came with these two viral types. One thing I want to state is that the viral load, if you consider HPV-11, was more uh, than the patients who had HPV-6 infection, but it did not probably translate into more aggressive disease. So if you ask me the patients who had got a viral HPV-11 infection, he is more likely to have more tracheal or pulmonary uh, involvement. I would say uh, it is not proven. It's not statistically significant. Surgical deep bulking, you may uh, uh, criticize it, you may accept it, but it's here to stay. It's probably one of the treatment of choice if the patient is presenting to you with large multiple 
tracheal papillomas. There is no way that you can start him from any other treatment and not debulk the airway. Surgical debulking is the treatment, first treatment of choice in most scenarios. So how do we do that debulking? Ma'am has discussed some bit of it. We can use our uh, standard cold instruments where we can uh, just use our laryngeal plucking forceps, go in the trachea, pluck the papillomas rapidly and send them for histologic evaluation. Coblation has come up in a big way in recent time. It's a good tool, uh, but coblation bands, I must confess, they are not standardized for reaching uh, the lower trachea and the areas that are close to carina. So uh, in lower trachea, uh, we are not very comfortable with use of coblation. Laser, ma'am had shown, it's a tool, very useful tool in upper aerodigestive tract. But reach of this laser to lower aerodigestive tract to lower trachea close to carina is still challenging. Although there are uh, endoscopic guided laser machines available, but their lack of precision and lack of speed makes it still not as viable option as the micro divider. So what we are using for debulking the disease in tracheal and pulmonary papillomas is the micro debrider. Ma'am had rightly mentioned and had quoted probably the same study. It is a good alternative. It is much cheaper alternative than laser. And more importantly, it is a precise and micro debrider. If you talk about Medtronic, they have made the blades that are uh, customized for work in the uh, trachea. So it's a small video uh, that you see uh, a, a flexible laryngoscopy evaluation before uh, the patient is being intubated. Uh, the whole trachea is filled with uh, uh, papillomas. So when do we debulk surgically if the patients are coming to us with tracheal and pulmonary papillomas? We don't go in at, at the diagnosis. Our policy is that the patient develops symptoms you intervene. If the patient come to us with borderline uh, strider or some breathing difficulty, that's the time that we like to intervene or we feel that the papillomas are large enough that they might cause some symptoms. Debulking of few papillomas, the patient who you have operated two months, three months back is a risky enterprise and probably not recommended in my view. Second indication for surgery in my institute is that if there are anecdotal small papillomas remaining, then we try to go in and use all our modalities and try to achieve cure by uh, eradicating the disease completely. So if you talk about the tracheal and bronchial papillomas, they were described long back in this very interesting case report that was published in Thorax Journal in 1969 where uh, they had uh, uh, published a case scenario in which they had done a pneumonectomy uh, for uh, uh, extensive pulmonary involvement and uh, they could see uh, papillomas involving both bronchi as well as lung parenchyma and uh, lower trachea. If you talk about radiology, one very important point that I want to make here is never do a radiology after you have operated on a case of tracheal papillomas or at least immediately after operation. The findings that you see on radiology can be very easily missed or mimicked by the changes of aspiration because they are more basal. They are more uh, seen in the lower lung fields as compared to the upper lung fields. The uh, apices are generally free. That differentiates it from more commonly seen pathology in Indian subcontinent, that is the miliary tuberculosis. Uh, the lesions are characteristically uh, cystic. They are uh, small cavities, they are micro cavities. The RRPs, they don't generally make large cavities and they are filled with fluid. Uh, this is one of our own patients, which we had published as a medical image in, in one of the pulmonary and critical care um, uh, uh, journals. And if you do a diagnostic imaging of thorax, which we do recommend in all cases who have got a tracheal involvement, you will see these characteristic uh, findings and uh, you will not miss the diagnosis. Ma'am had already talked about the frequency of involvement of tracheal and bronchopulmonary. One point that is very important I make here is that tracheal and pulmonary involvement can never be isolated. You will never have a patient because of uh, uh, the understood uh, uh, pathophysiology of disease who will have only tracheal or only pulmonary papillomas. You will always have a patient who is having a glottic disease that spreads to trachea and bronchopulmonary. So if you have a patient with RRP, then the chances of tracheal involvement is almost 14% and bronchopulmonary involvement would be almost around 4%. So if you see 100 patients, uh, 14 of them are likely to have tracheal involvement and four of them will have bronchopulmonary involvement. What causes uh, extensive RRPs in some patients? Some patients will have that limited glottic, supraglottic ventricle disease, while others will have whole trachea involved. We really don't know. The factors are largely unknown. 
but probably uh, it's the young age that plays a role as ma'am very rightly mentioned probably they have got an immature immunity and children who are younger than 3 years they are more likely to have a disease that is more extensive and more recurrences than older ones uh, trichotomy we have already talked and discussed probably trichotomy contributes to the spread of disease to lower airways lower trachea pulmonary involvement but i would feel at times it is the other way around also the patients who have got more extensive disease they tend to present at probably untrained centers with severe striders and respiratory compromise and they end up uh, with a tracheostomy which is the case in most of the patients that we see at our institute so why these cases are so challenging uh, first point that's probably very important point is the area where you are operating is the area where your anesthetist is uh, going to deliver the gases and oxygen to the patient so it's the area is shared with the anesthesiologist Uh, jet ventilation it appears a very effective uh, modality of delivering this but there is definitely a theoretical uh, potential that uh, the high pressure jet can seed the papillomas lower down the aero digestive tract so we don't use jet ventilation in these scenarios there is definitely a risk of aspiration and distal seeding i'll be talking on that as i mention uh, briefly about the surgical procedure there is no standard instrument that is made by any company for operations on distal trachea or proximal uh, bronchi and this is not a one time surgery you will have a patient who will come to you today you debulk you debrite despite best of medical treatments he'll be coming back to you after two months three months and it's not a one time surgery it's very frustrating at times to do these operations repeatedly because they are risky and they are very challenging ma'am has also brief, uh, briefly mentioned what we employ is the transoral transtomal most of our patients 95% of our patients they do have tracheostomy at presentation in these scenarios and we like to operate them uh, in intermittent apnea for lower tracheal regions of course these surgeries are done under general anesthesia and uh, we like to use these skimmer metronic blades because they are designed for laryngeal debulking but one practical point that i would like to mention here is these have got very small lumen here uh, contrast from the uh, cutting blades and they tend to get blocked as they suck in the papillomas and it's very frustrating to remove them when you are at a critical step of operation and you or change the blade or remove the blade or clean the blade so they are cumbersome at times you get frustrated and move on to uh, your cutting blades but these are the recommended blades if you are comfortable with them these should be used uh, more often so as i already mentioned we most of our patients they have got stoma at presentation we use both the ports for visualization we use the laryngeal port as well as the stomal port so if the patient is uh, is adult you can put both instruments through the stomal port you can put in the endoscope or tracheoscope as well as your debrider watch on screen and and debrider or if the patient is pediatric then the stomal port tends to be small it is difficult to insert both instruments then you can use the oral port for insertion of endoscope and debrider through the stomal port and you can do your uh, surgery that's the surgical steps that we follow we ventilate these patients adequately give them good oxygen for for some time let the oxygen saturation be at 100% for quite some time thereafter we go in good assistant is the uh, Im important asset to have debride as much as possible and once the anesthetist alarms you just reinsert the tube and put the cuff at the area where you have debrided it and it provides a effective hemostasis if it is required uh, one thing i want to make it clear that these patients since they have got chronic obstruction they tolerate uh, hypoxia better than the normal patients and they give you good amount of time to uh, to complete your surgery so we should pay attention uh, to adequate clearance of secretions and blood and the micro debrider suction is not enough for this you need to have two three suctions attached and at each uh, end of each event tell your assistant to put in through the stoma and suck out all the secretions as well as blood to uh, prevent clogging of airways as well as to suction out any loose lying papillomas out nowadays we are also keeping coagulation equipment uh, standby but uh, if you ask my experience we have almost never had alarming bleeding that has required a coagulation equipment for controlling it one practical point that i want to make here is that if it's a pediatric patient if it's a young patient then it's a good idea to put in a suture uh 
tagging suture at the stoma which can hold the stoma up or you can evert it using uh, using uh, the suture so that this stoma remains patent because at times if the anesthetist starts alarming you that the saturation is falling uh, to 80 uh, 75 or 70 it at times takes time to reinsert the tube as the stomal collapse is known so if you have sutures in place then the stoma can be kept well patent and you can immediately insert the tube it helps you uh, uh, by some time so that's how uh, it is done it's a 20 year old male with laryngeal and pulmonary rrps uh, we have inserted a, a stores a tracheoscope through the stoma you can see whole upper trachea lower trachea is full of uh, papillomas ma'am had very rightly mentioned we should do interval uh, biopsies of them every two three operations we like to take a biopsy because malignant change malignant transformation especially in adults is known uh, what we like to do is debride from below upwards if you start debriding the upper papillomas then your blood tends to trickle down and then your visualization of lower airways will uh, blood will soil your endoscope and it will be frustrating for you for visualize the lower airway papillomas it is always better to start below and move up but it is at times not possible if your upper airway is occluded with papillomas then you have to debride a bit to make way for your scope and debrider to go in Either way, you have to be careful that suctions are adequately cleared and you move from below upwards with your uh, micro debrider clearing all the papillomas. So that's the suction catheter. After every such exercise, tell your assistant to put in the suction and then reinsert the flexometallic tube. Give the patient good ventilation, uh, let the uh, saturation come up and repeat the procedure. I'm not saying that we cured this patient. This is the, this is the uh, uh, scenario a few weeks later. The skimmer blade, if used well, will not be very traumatic to the mucosa and we have not seen any uh, medium term or long term complications related to it. Another patient which was more challenging than the previous one that I had shown you, uh, the patient had almost 170 surgeries in his lifetime. He has grown up with uh, RRPs, multiple papillomas in trachea, multiple in the lung, the patient had been tracheostomized in the past, but fortunately or unfortunately, when he presented to us, uh, the tracheostomy had been removed and he was decannulated. It was more challenging. Uh, it is certainly a more challenging. There are anesthesia uh, uh, options available, which I would like the experts to discuss after my talk is over. But that was the scenario. It was starting right from glottis, subglottis, upper trachea, lower trachea and uh, almost uh, till the carina. You can see uh, papillomas at the carina also. So we intubate the, this patient. Uh, we, uh, for sake of avoiding bleeding and soiling of lower airway, uses used cobblator to debride the laryngeal uh, papillomas. I have not shown that in detail. We removed the endotracheal tube and placed it at the laryngeal introitus for immediate reinsertion if required. Followed the same steps as I mentioned in the transoral transdermal debridement. Uh, put in the micro debrider, obviously through the oral port. We did not have a tracheostomy here. Uh, debrided the papillomas rapidly and again inserted the tube uh, ourselves and uh, inflated the cuff at the area of uh, uh, debridement if possible. So we have almost 14 patients who had got more than uh, laryngeal and uh, uh, tracheal and pulmonary papillomas. Most of them were males. 69% uh, of these patients are males and 30% uh, oh, are females. And uh, as I already mentioned, the extensive disease is probably commoner in pediatric age group. Uh, nine patients were pediatric and four patients were uh, adult age group. Five patients had upper tracheal, three had uh, upper two-third trachea, six patients had entire trachea, and three patients had a disease that was involving bronchi and lungs. This retrospective analysis I had done a few years back, so I have not included more recent uh, patients in my analysis. The surgeries ranged from 3 to 175, uh, with the duration of disease from 9 to 34 years in adult patients and 3 to 12 years in uh, pediatric age group. Uh, out of 13 patients, we could achieve decannulation in nine patients. Minded one patient uh, did not have tracheostomy at presentation. Uh, two patients, both adults, they had uh, malignant transformation. And uh, surprisingly, uh, although it, I, I have mentioned many 
potential complications. We did not have a procedure related complication in any of these patients. The unfortunate lady who, who had a, a laryngeal uh, malignant transformation, we did a total laryngectomy. She had a stomal recurrence. We did a, a partial tracheal excision. Uh, she had a pharyngeal recurrence. We did a total pharyngectomy and a patch pharyngoplasty, but unfortunately could not be salvaged. Some of them I have already uh, discussed. Excessive bleeding is an expected complication. It can happen, but we like to use endotracheal cuff judiciously. Never use debridement blindly unless you are seeing the blade. Never put push uh, your uh, foot switch on, uh, and it should not be debriding in the area blinded to uh, the observer or the surgeon. Adrenaline pledgets can be a good idea to to uh, control small capillary bleeds. Aspiration pneumonia is definitely a theoretical risk. I am always wary of it while I'm operating. Probably I'm very, very careful. Uh, prevention, definitely suctioning, suctioning and suctioning, both with debrider suction. Debrider suction is not adequate. You have to use another suction, maybe two or three, no blockage of suction. Steroids, obviously, intraoperatively and a course of a day or two of antibiotics. We have had uh, uh, the times when we had the adrenaline rush. We, we could not uh, uh, put, put, put in the uh, tracheostomy tube back. And I have already mentioned about the stay stomal suture that we started after that. It can be troublesome in pediatric age group where the both the stromal as well as the oral airways are smaller. Uh, we have our brief experience on 14 patients that we have discussed. Uh, we have. Uh, 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 a paper on this which has been accepted in ECTA Otolaryngologica and will soon be uh, published our experience on tracheobronchial RRPs. I'll be only talking about the adjuvant treatments that we have experience of. We have used the celecoxib and jeftinib in one patient with fair response. We have used interferon in one patient. Interferon therapy, we have experience with this. It acted reasonably, but it's a very, very long treatment. Uh, it is very frustrating because it's fraught with side effects and you have to very frequently involve pediatricians in this. So it is not a very practical solution for most scenarios. Uh, two practical situations that I would like to mention are about the quadrivalent HPV vaccine, Gardasil. We don't have huge experience in this. We have used in few patients. I cannot say that it, it acted or did not act because you really need to plan your study uh, well. And the other is, as ma'am mentioned, uh, about the Avastin. I have used the intralesional uh, Avastin in two patients who are really frustrating and intralesional bevacizumab in my hands at intervals in two patients did not help. It, it, it did not seem to work at least. Uh, we have evaluated at our center uh, the potential for uh, uh, Indian patients of use of Avastin. As ma'am mentioned, it's a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. So we have conducted a small study on 32 subjects where we have evaluated both serum as well as the tissue uh, VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor. Mind it, it's the receptor on which your Avastin or Bevacizumab acts and it is significantly higher in patients who have got RRP as compared to control samples. And there is a trend uh, that VGF expression is more if the patients have got higher DRK score or more disease. Uh, we have used a systemic bevacizumab or Avastin in three patients. I am not saying that this is a dramatic drug because uh, our trial has never been planned that way. But we have some evidence to show that it has shown some regression at least in a couple of patients. You can see uh, before and after treatment a very typical way of uh, uh, showing your clinical uh, reports at almost the same area, papillomas before and after bevacizumab. But I am not strongly putting my point because of a reason that I'll be shortly discussing. So we give it in a dose of 10 mg per kg in the first three doses given two weeks apart, followed by effusion every three weeks. No major side effects till date, but it, it is uh, definitely given in consultation with the uh, pediatric oncologist. HPV vaccine, although is a topic of discussion in my next talk, but it's very important because uh, cervical lesions or cervical intraepithelial neoplasias, they are very related pathophysiologically to the HPVs. And this is a very landmark future two study group trial published in 2017, where they have found, and it's in New England Journal of Medicine, where women who had not been infected with HPV or 16 or 18, those in vaccine group had significantly lower occurrence of high grade cervical neoplasia related to 16 or 18 uh, than the placebo group. And this has been extrapolated to our own specialty. Uh, if you look at the literature for last three, four years, then probably this is one of the most landmark studies in HPV. 
uh, it is the incidence of HPV before uh, the HPV vaccination was a norm in Australia and after it's a norm in Australia and it's a clearly decreasing trend. So HPV vaccine, we cannot say about treatment, but for, for prevention and protection against HPV, it has definitely a huge potential. And if, uh, if brought in in a big way, it definitely has a potential to eradicate this disease. Ours was one of the centers which had ICMR funded research project. Uh, PI was Professor Alok Thakkar, where we did a double blind placebo uh, controlled RCT to evaluate efficacy of Thuja in decreasing the severity uh, and post surgical procedure recurrence in RRPs. We had around 54 patients, eight loss to follow up. One was a recruitment error. So, study on 45 patients, age group two years to 52 years, 30 males, uh, 15 females. Uh, Thuja did not have. Uh, impact on decreasing the disease frequency or bringing about uh, the resolution of disease. But what I stated in my Bevacizumab uh, uh, slide is important. Spontaneous regressions are seen in this disease. So you may have patients who are either in placebo group or in a Thuja group who had spontaneous regressions. You cannot explain why the patient regressed, but all of a sudden the disease uh, stopped uh, appearing or, it, uh, or the frequency of your surgeries decreased. And that's why when I mentioned the Bevacizumab, I did not attribute it very strongly to Bevacizumab because we strongly and sincerely need a randomized controlled trial for Avastin uh, in Indian scenario. So these are the conclusions from my talk. Transoral transtromal debridement is safe and effective procedure. It is a good procedure, although you need a bit of expertise, both anesthesia and surgeon for debulking of papillomas. Surgery, I'm not saying is curative. It is a debulking surgery and alternate therapies they do need to be looked into very, very uh, sincerely. Most patients do well. We could decannulate 13 out of uh, nine out of 13 patients. Two of them had malignant transformation and only one patient is uh, still with tracheostomy. Malignant transformation is known and occurs mostly in adults. We, we almost have never seen a malignant transformation in a, a pediatric age group. So thank you so much. And uh, any questions or further discussion is welcome. Thank you. Phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much, Kapil. I mean, excellent talk. And uh, you really touched all those very important aspects uh, of practical uh, treatment uh, for these very difficult conditions. I'm very happy to see that there's a subterranean uh, conversation chat going on between all the um, uh, attendees and the experts, which is very nice. And hopefully, we should uh, collaborate more with the extensive, uh, uh, extensive clinical material that we have. Definitely. Hopefully, we should collaborate. And uh, especially, we should start off with at least a papilloma registry, which was mooted by many of us uh, here many years back. I think we should work together. And uh, right now, uh, uh, quick comments from our three panelists. Can we go back to Karthik? Uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, your comments. So uh, can I just briefly, uh, I am seeing Dr. Deepak has mentioned intralesional has more reported in adult RRP. Uh, uh -huh. I, uh, our, uh, we, uh, we have used in, in the patients who have really frustrated us, one adult and one, uh, one um, uh, pediatric. And may I add uh, to uh, a question to this, whether there is any technique that is mentioned, how many injections, what all subsides, if the whole trachea is full of papillomas and where all to inject and, uh, and any, any technique, probably my technique was not good. That's why my patients didn't do well. Uh, Prahlad, can you please unmute? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, he's unmuted. He's unmuted. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Karthik. Sure, sure, sure. So, sorry, I think <laughs> these are really hard patients. No question. I, I think those were some impressive cases and, and uh, very challenging. And, and the access, anatomic access and bleeding are both, I think, a problem. Um, one of, you know, I have tried and seen people try lots of different things, including laser fibers through a flexible endoscope. Uh, you know, coblation, debreeder, and unfortunately our reach is just limited um, and I think in some ways limited to almost a palliative approach where we just try to keep the airway open so these patients can breathe better. Um, you know, there are a lot of different uh, medical strategies that have been tried and some of you have probably tried inhaled sit off of air and things like that. 
Um, there's one case report of inhaled sildenafil, and I've actually taken care of that patient as well. Deepak may have as well at some point, because um, a lot of us have. Uh, and the case report looked very promising, and unfortunately, after the case report was published, the child had progressive disease and passed away anyway. Um, so it is a very difficult problem. Um, the uh, I think this is one where IV Avastin is really going to be the the mainstay of treatment, and that has been really what a lot of us are resorting to here in the US as well. Um, still on a trial basis, but uh, systemic therapy, I think, has to be the mainstay uh, with surgical treatment more for system pal uh, symptomatic palliation than anything else. That is, what, is how I would look at it, I think. Um, thank you, Karthik. Uh, we go to uh, Bikram, any comments? Unmute to uh, Dr. So Bikram Chaudhary. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. sir. Actually, I had uh, two things to say. One is, of course, regarding the fact that uh, some anti-reflux agents also have been seen to assist in uh, health and management of these cases, especially in smaller children with proper diet and an anti-reflux. Uh, you know, we, they have been found to have lesser uh, number of papillomatosis episodes and that is lesser number of the larger gaps between surgeries. And secondly, I wanted to just amplify a little bit more about what Kapil was talking about regarding the anesthetic challenges. And these challenges are quite a bit, basically our options like in, you know, foreign body cases also, we have these challenges. We need an expert anesthesiologist and from starting from spontaneous ventilation. In one of our cases, we landed up, the patient went into laryngospasm and we averted a catastrophe by just a, you know, slim margin. So uh, then, then you can have this uh, method he was talking about, Dr. Kapil, about intermittent apnea and reintubation. The problem is, again, reintubation is uh, every time we do the reintubation into the pharynx and then pull it out and then do the surgery, we land up with a chance of an increased spread of the virus through the this repeated placement. And then, of course, for laser itself, we tend to not, many of us don't have access or we, the patients are unable to afford a laser tube. So we use these wrapped tubes the problem with these wrapped tubes, of course, is that the outer diameter of the tube increases, whereas the inner diam diameter remains, you know, less. So we basically are compromising between uh, both ventilation and, you know, uh, visualization. And uh, lastly, about JET that uh, you mentioned, JET is very good, but there needs to be a very good surgeon and sociologist communication because otherwise uh, you notice that there is drying of the trachea and that leads to that may lead to damage to the trachea. That is one, and you have to intimate the anesthesiologist that listen, just hold on for a sec. We want to go ahead after a minute or two. And the second thing, jet of course has got its inherent complications of causing pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, increasing thoracic pressure, and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, basically, the anesthesia challenges are quite a bit. I think uh, that has to be kept in mind. Thank you, Deepak. Quick comments. Yeah. So. Um, Excellent talk by Kapil. Uh, I'll just reiterate some of the points which Kapil made and some of the uh, points which Karthik made as well. Um, one of the things is whatever tool you use, you go with the name because this is a spectrum of disease. We know there are some patients who have very mild disease and they get better. We always remember the ones which keep coming back to us. So the unfortunately, and our thought process goes back to how we treat it based on all our difficult patients. And so we need to keep that in mind. So the ones which comes back again and again are the ones you need to go with a name. And as Kapil and Karthik uh, mentioned, you need to um, go with a name to say, I'm here to just improve the airway. And whatever tool you use, you need to use it wisely. Like Kapil said, when you're using the micro debreeder, you should see the tip of the blade all the time. So it's very important. So people talk about like, I use laser all the time. It works really well. That's fine. But use it wisely, not to cause damage um, to tissues we, you, which you're not supposed to. So that's, that's an important point. The other thing what's going on uh, is, uh, at least in US, because and someone I know someone is going to talk about the vaccine uh, used as a, in the general population. So we have seen a down trend of seeing less and less papilloma cases as the general population is getting vaccinated by the, uh, by the uh, multivalent vaccine. So there is definitely a downward trend of uh, incidence of papillomas 
we are seeing. And the last thing is, anything we do, unless we do as a multi-center trial, there's no point in saying this worked or not work because everyone's will be a small case series. So it's very important that we have a group which is putting thoughts together and come up with a multi-center trial. That way it is properly studied and properly done. Thank you, Deepak. I think uh, we should move on to the next uh, topic, uh, which is very interesting. The pediatrician's perspective on the whole thing. Can uh, Dr. Jagdish uh, Chinnapa be unmuted and uh, screen sharing started? Yeah, yeah. He's already a co-host, sir. Yeah. Dr. Jagdish Chinnapa is a very uh, respected uh, member of the pediatric community. He's the president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics Respiratory Chapter. He's the chairman of the pediatric uh, services uh, in the Manipal group of hospitals. And uh, he's been a partner in crime uh, whenever we used to treat patients. He used to be with us and helping us. Uh, no aspersions cast on his character. Um, Jagdish, uh, just go ahead, uh, share your screen and come out with your question. Just trying to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, just a moment. Sorry about this. Okay. The screen visible now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Raman, thank you very much and the Pediatric Airway Group for inviting me here today to speak on this uh, important topic of insights into the HPV vaccine prophylaxis. Um, the last one hour has been like a child, you know, I'm a pediatrician, like a child going into a nuclear physics class. There so many new things and so many procedures which uh, we don't see normally. And uh, thanks to Dr. Raman, we have been managing a few cases of um, uh, papillomatosis and I will just go through the vaccine part of it. Well, the role of HPV vaccine in uh, this condition can be either prophylactic or therapeutic. I think this has been touched upon um, very briefly by my previous speakers, Dr. Nupur and Dr. Kapil, on both the prophylactic role and the therapeutic role. So I will just uh, go through a little bit more in detail on some of these aspects. Now, as we know that HPV has, there are more than 180 types of the HPV virus which are there and the most common ones which are implicated are the type 6 and type 11, which are the ones which are implicated. The 11 type has been reported to produce earlier disease, more severe disease and recurrent disease with a predilection for malignancy. Of course, this probably would be different in different uh, uh, areas and may not be uniform at uh, this thing. The transmission probably occurs at birth from HPV infected microenvironment. Uh, well, there has been some studies which have shown that the primiparous teenage mother uh, is the with a prolonged labor is probably the one who is most likely to transmit the disease. Now, coming to the presentation, usually between one and six years of age, dysphonia is the main presenting symptom. Strider, dyspnea, chronic cough, sometimes hemoptysis and rarely pulmonary involvement. Uh, Dr. Kapil had shown some of the uh, x-rays and the scanning reports of that. Now, coming to the prevention of the vaccines which are available, we have basically two kinds of vaccines available in India. That is the bivalent vaccine 1618 or the Cervarix, which has no effect on uh, the papillomatosis. The quadrivalent vaccine has the 6, 11, 16 and 18. And this is the one which has been used for prevention of the papillomatosis because it contains the two main antigens the 6 and 11. There's another 9-valent vaccine which is now available in the United States of America. It's not yet licensed for use in India. And this covers uh, more of the vaccine types than the quadrivalent vaccine. Now, the quadrivalent vaccine is primarily 6, 11, 16, 18, which is uh, sourced from Saccharomyces cerevisia. And it, it covers 90% of genital warts, 6 and 11, um, of the types. The 9-valent vaccine is given to girls between 9 and 26 years of age and boys between 9 and 15 years of age. It has all the types which are there in the quadrivalent vaccine. In addition, it also has the type 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58, which account for about 20% of cervical cancers. It probably would also cover to some extent some of the uh, types which are not being uh, detected on this thing. Right? Now, what is the role in prevention? 
this was already this slide was already shown by dr kapil before i'll just expand on this this is probably one of the first studies which showed uh, on a population based basis of how the uh, hpv led uh, papillomatosis has come down over year with vaccination australia introduced uh, vaccination in both boys and girls and it showed that there was a gradual uh, reduction in the frequency of over over time and therefore it probably has a uh, mass effect now as far as the uh, what are the caveats for this kind of a result to get to get in our country one is there has to be a public health implementation of the vaccine with good coverage we need to vaccinate at least 60 to 70% of the population to get a coverage like what they got in australia now you also have to vaccinate boys and girls in um, india the vaccine is licensed only for girls it is not yet licensed for boys therefore we are missing out on a huge amount of population there the third thing is the timing of administration it's very important that the vaccine is administered before the first sexual debut and therefore it in the uh, if you look at most of the recommendations the recommendations are, are to give it early before 14 years of age um, giving it later may not have the best efficacy schedules are again changing we used to give three doses of the vaccine now we have we know that two doses are sufficient and in some of the trials even one dose has been shown to be very good if it is one dose then we have a very very attractive vaccine because the cost and the uh, cost of both the vaccine and the administration comes down quite dramatically now coming to the therapeutic indications few studies have been done on adjunctive therapy in adults and it has shown that it reduces the interventions after vaccination how does it do it i think primarily immunological and antibody induced inhibition is one of the things that has been shown the second thing is also on the cmi based response these are early days we really don't know whether this is going to work the other issue which will come up is if for a therapeutic vaccine to be used if we see children between the ages of 1 and 6 this vaccine is licensed only about 9 years of age so are we going to advocate the use of this vaccine in smaller children is an ethical issue because it has not been either studied or licensed for this age so in conclusion the quadrivalent or nonvalent vaccine has a definite role in preventing genital hpv and subsequent probably rhp however it should be administered early and cover 6 and 11 it should be in the national schedule boys and girls both must be given there may be a role for use as a therapeutic vaccine we still need data of course there are, as i mentioned there are ethical and legal challenges thank you thank you so much uh, jagdish uh, i call him quick draw mid draw the indian version of uh, quick gun murugan he puts it across uh, his thoughts so fast so quickly succinctly that we can take this message home now what do our panelists think about it uh, can we start once again with uh, dr deepak need to yes yeah so yeah very well said uh, i think as i told earlier um you, the in us the commonly used vaccine is the quadrivalent one and uh, and it's more used uh, in the teenagers uh, college going kids and it's on the national schedule so most people nowadays are using it and because of that i uh, as i said it's it's shown definitely a downward trend overall speaking to all my colleagues there is definitely the number of rrp cases we are seeing is much less um i don't have any um uh any um i've not tried the intralesional uh, vaccine ever so i don't know if anyone else has used it and has any response um so i'll it'll be interesting to see if anyone else has used intralesional um vaccine Vikram, quick uh, comments from you, uh, sir. I just hope that uh, we soon have uh, get to use these, get to see the use of these vaccines in these younger children, and also that the nine-valent vaccine should be made available to us in India as soon as possible. There was some uh, role considered earlier about the use of mumps vaccine intravenously, but I think that has been proven to be not of much use. So that's that's all I can say about that. right and um, uh, dr uh, kartik uh, any comments on the vaccine i uh, i agree completely with the other panelists that this is a public health problem not an individual patient problem and as we 
see broader use of the vaccine, my hope is greatly that we'll see fewer of these patients with less severe disease, but then also long-term, of course, lower incidence of HPV-related head and neck cancer and so on. So I think it, that's really the way to go long-term. In terms of the mumps vaccine, I agree uh, with Dr. Kapila. The, the, uh, it keeps coming up in conversation, but actually there's very little data and I don't think the data has been particularly exciting. So I think our focus should be elsewhere. Um, uh, we have the pleasure to something. Come, Dr. Kishore. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Cut no, in. I was just saying, this is, this is just something where I think as otolaryngologists, we have some role to advocate with the government bodies to spread the use of the vaccine. Sorry. Right. Um, Dr. Kishore Sandhu has joined us. Can you just uh, 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 unmute Dr. Kishore? Was that possible? Kishore, are you with us? Yeah, hi, Raman. Hey, Love thanks for coming. Love. Really appreciate your presence. Thank you so very much. No, I think I think nothing, nothing, nothing from my side. I think uh, you know, as far as the vaccine is concerned, what we are doing currently is we are vaccinating all children, or rather, everyone who gets uh, papillomas. In fact, we are straight away going ahead and vaccinating them. And uh, yes, as regards, unfortunately, I joined in a little bit late. Uh, but, a, but just a couple of comments, in fact, um, uh, would be that uh, I think for me, I think most the, one of the important points is that it is quite interesting that majority of these things, uh, the, the data that is coming out is basically based on some kind of, you know, large term uh, case reports or, uh, you know, uh, the data is not really concrete. Uh, Fred from uh, Fred Rickers from Ger from Holland, in fact, he has um, done a lot of work in Europe. Uh, but I think for me, a couple of things that I really practice in my uh, working style would be that, as regards surgery is concerned, it is quite interesting that it is interesting to accept some papillomas rather than risk a permanent sequelae. So this is critical. This is number one. Then I think there are certain risky areas where I think our surgical sort of intervention should be really, really carefully done. And these risky areas are basically the anterior commissure, the posterior commissure, and the circumferential subglottis. Remember, these papillomas actually have the affinity for squamociliary junctions. So it's not only in the larynx. We're looking at the Lyman vestibuli, so in the nose, we're looking at the nasopharyngeal portion of the soft palate. We're looking at the ventricular morgagni. We're looking at the free or the undersurface of the vocal cords. And then it starts coming into the metaplastic areas. So typically this would be at the carina. It will be at the bronchial spurs. And most importantly, it will be the tracheostoma. So I think these areas need to be taken care of. For me, as regards the Durkee scores are concerned, I divide, it, divide them very simply into a low-grade, moderate-grade kind of a disease where our attention should be for voice restoration. And then you have the severe grade of papillomas where the, the problem is basically to restore airway. So for me, the two areas or the two points that are important is voice restoration and airway restoration. Regarding one of the questions which I saw was that how do you select to inject? We use a lot of cytofovate. I mean, you know, uh, with the kind of work that has been happening in France with Patrick Frolich when he was there in uh, Lyon, uh, we use a lot of cytofovate in all these patients. So the way we actually use our anesthesiology uh, area would be that we do it under successive apnea. We never use any kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, you know forceful airing uh, or ventilation in form of either, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, forceful uh, ventilation. Um, we use a lot of NBI in these kind of patients, basically because there are certain times, you know, you don't see these papillomas too well. So to inject, I use sometimes NBI to know exactly where I want to inject. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I think Kapil mentioned is uh, spontaneous regression. So a lot is based on the immunity and the immune modulation in these patients. 
So I think we just have to keep our fingers crossed uh, and hope that this particular immune modulation happens. And I think uh, that's what uh, I would be really looking forward to. So I think the bottom line for me would be to accept certain papillomas, but um, you know, take care of the iatrogenic sequelae, take care of the airway. I think that's more important. Thank you so much, Kishore. And uh, is Dr. Jagdish Chinapa around? Uh, any questions for Jagdish? Uh, Deepa, can you help me? Any questions for Dr. Jagdish regarding vaccination? Because no, uh, my question would be: What's what's going on on the national level in India to push for the vaccination? Because that will be very important. So it'll need a lot yes. of push from the pediatricians, uh, and um, means the, the way in US it happened was they push more towards to say the benefit of cervical cancer and we had the byproduct of it in, in the sense because there was a push towards cervical cancer we had an improvement and now with hpv induced oropharyngeal and laryngeal cancers it becomes important for us to push so I'm, uh, my question is is there any push uh, towards that uh, thank you sir thank you for that excellent question there are a couple of things over here the first thing is that in India, till now, as a public health policy, the government was more interested in reducing under five mortality. So the vaccination was geared towards reducing mortality first. And therefore, uh, they were more worried about getting rid of pertussis, diphtheria, tetanus, and other kinds of communicable disease. Um, MMR was the next focus, and they have now uh, launched into a universal MMR vaccine program to cover most children. Uh, the adolescent vaccination into which group this falls has not been given too much of an importance primarily because of the no immediate mortality that happens because of it uh, it will come and it is it is on the national agenda to introduce the hpv vaccine two or three things have happened which have put a break on this the first thing has been a kind of a ethical issue where two trials were done by um, uh, various organizations in andhra pradesh and Gujarat, and there was some mortality of girls, uh, which happened, and then that was that raised a public interest litigation, and uh, therefore this implementation of the uh, HPV vaccine was stalled. The third thing is the cost considerations, because though Gavi is supporting HPV vaccine predominantly in African countries, it has not been uh, available for India as yet. The, uh, what has happened is that there are vaccine manufacturers in India who are trying to roll out an indigenous HPV vaccine, uh, at least two of them. So we are waiting for that too. So ultimately in the private sector, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics has advocated for use of HPV vaccine in all patients who can afford it. So a large percentage of uh, children who are in the affordable category, who are outside the ambit of the public health system are getting the vaccine. However, uh, it's, not a, it, it, it's not been implemented as a, a universal immunization program as yet from the government. It will happen, but it may take a couple of more years. Thank you, Jagdish. Um, I think uh, we'll move to the next speaker. And uh, this is the uh, most important part, I mean, not to belittle the other speakers. We have uh, uh, Dr. Tripti who's going to wrap it all up in the problems that she has faced. She's a postdoctoral fellow on pediatric ENT from the Christian Medical College, Velour. She's going to uh, present a case to us so that we revise all the concepts we learned from the beginning uh, of this session. Can I request Dr. Tripti to come um, share a screen? Yes, sir. And then we go to questions after that. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Tripti. And first of all, I would like to thank Pralad sir and Raman sir for creating such a beautiful platform, especially for giving us an opportunity in this platform with all stalwarts in this uh, pediatric ENT. So for people like us who are very junior to this field, it's very encouraging. And when we see a case with Jor, at the initial stage, it always feels impossible. So here I'm presenting a case who was a six-year-old child who presented to us, when child presented to us, it was already a diagnosed case of jaw, had undergone multiple surgeries, also had been tracheostomized for respiratory distress. So when we took this child under GA, we saw that there was extensive papillomas completely obstructing the airway. There is no anatomical landmark that you can see. 
So we had to debride the papillomas to give her an airway. So once we start debriding the papillomas, you can notice that there is scarring at the level of the anterior and the posterior glottic region. And the cords are not visible. As we go down, we can see papillomas in the suprastomal region. And when we retract the tube, we can also see papillomas in the lower trachea. So we expect papillomas in the lower trachea, especially when there's a tracheostomy. But here, it was completely obscuring the airway. So the aim of our surgery here, debridement, was only to give an adequate airway and to also keeping in mind that it was a circumferential involvement. So over debridement would cause scarring. So what I learned from this case was, one, the tracheostomy. So in case of jaw, it's always advisable to avoid tracheostomy. At one point, it might feel that tracheostomy is life-saving, but uh, tracheostomy will cause chronic irritation at the lower limit of the tube, at the tip of the tube also leading to seeding of the papillomas into lower airway. And managing a lower airway papillomas is much more difficult than an upper airway uh, or a laryngeal papilloma. And again, a line about debridement, it's a very thin line between over debridement and adequate debridement. So over debridement is always harmful in a way that it causes scarring, distortion of the anatomy and the functional outcome of larynx is not maintained. So this was another case who was a five-year-old child, known case of JORP again, presented to our casualty in respiratory distress. As you can see, this child is having severe chest retractions, work of breathing is increased already on oxygen. So our aim here was to prevent a tracheostomy and take her under GA. So what we did, we took her on spontaneous ventilation, no tubing, patient is on breathing spontaneously and it's completely obscuring the airway, so we had to give her an airway by debriding. And as you can see, there was no anatomy at the initial stage, but as we debride, the anatomy becomes much more clearer. This child has had 22 surgeries till day, and this child is becoming much better. And this child presented two months back to us, and we saw that the severity of the papilloma has come down. Like you can see here, this is two months back, the severity of papilloma significantly reduced. And also, the anatomy is much more well preserved here. And this is the, uh, the trachea where there is no seeding of the papilloma into the lower airway by avoiding tracheostomy. So what I would like to say is the anesthesia. So even in case of an emergency, we can avoid tracheostomy by avoiding paralyzing the child, making the child breathe spontaneously by uh, supplementing with high flow oxygen and of course, a good anesthetist. And tracheostomy, by avoiding a tracheostomy, we have prevented seeding of the papilloma into the lower airway. So this was a nine-year-old child, again, a case of JORP. As you can see, severe papilloma obstructing the airway, no anatomy. So here, what I would like to show is, even when there are no anatomical landmarks, you're debriding in a way that you can see the blade and you're debriding. And as you keep debriding, the anatomy becomes much more clearer. And as you can see, the anatomy is maintained. This is the child on remission. There is no recurrence of papilloma and the anatomy is very well maintained. So always the anatomy has to be res uh, respected. These children require multiple surgeries. And as you respect the anatomy, the uh, scarring is avoided and hence the functional outcome is better, both in terms of airway as well as voice. So these were the few cases, I mean, there are a few more cases which uh, gave us the idea of using uh, or trying a trial on uh, intralesional uh, intra or IV Avastin. So we were thinking of Avastin, but now because of the COVID era, the study is on hold. So I would like to highlight that when you're operating on JOR, less is always better because the more you uh, try to be overzealous with your debridement, it leads to scarring. So I would like to conclude by saying persistence always the key to success. And I would like to thank Mary Kudin ma'am without whom this program would not have been existent. And of course, my colleagues without whom my fellowship program would not have been so enjoyable. And my very, very helpful bosses, Ajoy sir, Kamran sir, Naina ma'am and Mary ma'am, without whom I would have not learned anything. Thank you. That was an excellent talk, you know, kind of uh, wrapping up what all we was told to us earlier. And I congratulate you on your wonderful uh, presentation. But I think uh, you should hear uh, the comments of the uh, experts here. It will gladden your heart. I'm sure they're of the same opinion. 
Uh, Deepak, uh, you want to say something about the young lady's presentation? No, points, uh, points very well made. Uh, I think it's very important not to, uh, like it's been mentioned before by other speakers as well, it's very important to go with the name. Uh, I personally prefer a micro debreeder, but you can use any tool which you are comfortable with. Um, and uh, just make sure you're not causing any damage which you're not intended to. Two things about the blade which we use for micro debreeder when there is aggressive disease and it's on, not on the vocal cord. I like to use the tricard, but you have to be very careful. It's mainly because it saves you some time. Whenever you're working in the area where you have to be um, um, very precise, especially say on the vocal cord, that's when I use the, um, the other one. The other thing you can do when you're working on lesions on the vocal cord is you can in inject some saline, which will lift the papilloma up. And that way, your micro debreeder is not causing as much scarring. So um, those will be the tips when using around the vocal cords. So wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, any comments, uh, Kishore? I think I think Truthi did a good job. And you know, I think she's uh, summarized the entire thing correctly. I completely agree with her that lesser is better. Wonderful. Um, what about Bikram? Any comments? Uh, sir, I would just like to say that as uh, she's given a completely comprehensive talk about the whole issue. Uh, one thing I would like to again, uh, I mean, I would like to stress on is the fact that subglottis is a problem. Whenever we are doing this kind of surgeries, we often tend to leave some in the subglottis to miss it. We have to focus a bit on the subglottis as well. And as she mentioned, anesthesia is one of the most key things. I mentioned that earlier as well. So that's very, very important. And again, I agree with her totally that the outcome of airway and voice is the primary concern. And we should probably leave some papilloma rather, and we can always go back to it later, knowing that this will recur at some point of time. So this layer removal of the vocal cords and leaving things behind when we are not really sure uh, about it, then that is a much better approach than just going in and removing everything and exposing and then causing a poor voice and poor airway uh, result. A uh, quick comment, Kartik. Sure, I, uh, I agree completely with everything. That was a great case presentation, thank you. Um, the only other thing I would add is I think setting expectations with the patient or the parents is really important. Uh, you know, we can keep in mind that you will have to come back, but they need to be aware of that and need to be aware that surgery is not a curative thing, but a, an interval treatment. Shruti, very well done. You actually left us all speechless, actually. You wrapped up the whole thing beautifully. Thank you very much for that. We have a big audience here of very experienced people who have trained other uh, people, uh, youngsters. Uh, but we have Biswajit here who comes from the state of Assam. Uh, and he's got an interesting video. We have a little time. So I'm just putting that in before we start off our uh, 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 question and answer session or ask the expert or whatever. It's open house. Anyone can uh, volunteer to say, uh, to come on and answer something. But then we'll stick to the panelists. In a, uh, once they answer or if there's any discussion, we can go ahead. Uh, Biswajit, can you share your screen? Prala, do you have to help? Yeah, he's, he's a co-host. You can share now. Yeah. Okay. Biswajit uh, comes from Guwahati, and I had the privilege of visiting their center about, uh, I don't know how many years back. They just started airway work, and uh, he claims that we were part of the inspiration, which I don't think it's true. But it's all thanks to people like Deepak and uh, Kishore who have popularized uh, pediatric airway. And now, of course, we have Karthik. And uh, so far away centers in India, young people like Biswajit are uh, taking over and doing excellent work. Go ahead, Biswajit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're always encouraging for us. And it's a very learned platform. An excellent talk by Nupur ma'am. Also, the couple, so much extensive relations I have seen first time. And thanks uh, also to the vaccine paper. So that's I uh, had one baby actually, uh, six months old. And um, he he presented with a uh, papillomatosis, extensive papillomatosis in the supraglottic, glottic, and also subglottic. But the main issue was he had a retroglottic, uh, 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 postglottic extension also. Also, when I have seen that I have found it, it is extending to the kicopharynx and also the upper esophagus. The issue was how I have to remove 
now i have the video so, so <coughs> i can uh, share it here and uh, how i had to approach the uh, retroglottic uh, part and also the uh, upper uh, issue physical lesion that's what i i have the issue actually so i want to learn from the london people and uh, how, how should approach in this kind of uh, scenario Hello, sir. You are sharing your video, uh, Dr. Biswajit. Ah, uh, so I'll six, sir. Uh, let's let's. I can I can share this. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're playing a PowerPoint or a video file, directly? Uh, no, just uh, directly I'll go to the video. I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you should do is you should share. I'll like play first. Ah, uh, yeah, sir. You should share that application. Whether yeah. it is. Uh, Windows Media Player or VLC. So is my screen is visible? Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, good. Yeah. So uh, have you seen this is the? Uh, can you appreciate the tube, sir? Here, he was a six-month-old child. He has a. Let's. Uh, can you appreciate the papilloma? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, so it is basically. Yeah, uh, if I can move forward a little bit. This is not the glottic portion, actually, sir. I can, if you move forward, then I can show you. It is basically the posterior pharyngeal wall, if you if you can say. And uh, now you can appreciate that this is a glottic portion, actually. This is a tube. This is the glottic portion, and this is you can appreciate the postglottic region, and it is extending up to thicker pharynx. My fear was if I go with a powered instrument. Then there's every chance of uh, cricopharyngeal uh, stenosis and later on he has an issue with the swallowing and all this thing. So uh, this is the issue I want to uh, um, want to learn from and experience from your side, sir. What we should do basically. Come on, sir. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Any uh, you want some comments from our experts? Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, sir. Because I'm this part I'm comfortable with a powered instrument, maybe copulator, maybe saver. But when I approach the kikopharynx, uh, because in the later portion I have seen there's extension of the papilloma up to kikopharynx. Any thoughts on that, Deepak? Uh, no, I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, I've never had a patient in the kikopharynx, so uh, this is first time for me. But uh, I think the management would still be uh, exactly the same. Um, Kishore, any comments? I think, you know, as we said that, you know, this is a, a, a disease or a lesion which has got more affinity for the squamociliary epithelium. So majority of the times, if there is seeding elsewhere, it is iatrogenic. So we keep on sort of, you know, coming back to the same thing that, you know, try to reduce iatrogenic sequelae in these patients. Now, coming back to what we are seeing currently, yes, I would actually keep it very, very limited resection. I would avoid contral I would avoid collateral damage whilst I'm using, um, you know, uh, the coablation. I would first not use the coablation uh, because eventually what we're trying to do is we are in a way inducing scar tissue. We're inducing, in fact, you know, metaplastic changes more and more. So there are more chances of A stenosis, B spread of the disease. So I think these are the two things which are interesting. As regards the trachea is concerned, it's the same situation. We have used stents in the trachea, we have used stents in the bronchi uh, to keep the airway open. We use them very, very regularly. Uh, but again, I mean, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to <clears throat> keep the lumen open, whether it is in the 
trachea, bronchi, or now here, in fact, in the esophagus. So eventually, anything that we are doing, we are going to introduce some kind of iatrogenic damage. Think about why and how we can reduce the iatrogenic sequelae, and this is the way actually to go ahead. So whatever we do, see to it that, you know, even if some papillomas are there, you have to accept them and try to avoid a complete clearance that will actually eventually go into an iatrogenic sequelae. But the treatment would be debulking. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What actually I did here, I utilized the suction of the coagulation and that way the papilloma is sucked out uh, more superiorly. That means it was the feel of my uh, operation. And that's how I limited my dissection at, as far as possible, the how much papilloma comes to my field. And that's how, but interestingly, the boys comes after two years, again, which are only the glottic papilloma. I recently, as I said, a few weeks back, and there's as such no papilloma uh, in the kick of rings or in the esophageal area. Uh, and he has a, no issue with the swallowing also. That's all, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you I for can, presenting. Uh, no? Uh, Dr. Raman, I would just like to say here that uh, such situations when they arise, uh, I encounter this kind of problem of identifying the trichopharynx, the esophagus, very often in because I'm doing a lot of work on corrosive strictures, uh, caustic strictures, and you can't identify exactly where you are. So this uh, one option that is always there, apart, I use coblation in these areas with an MLW wand typically. And it reaches pretty well, and uh, you can handle the coblator uh, this area quite quite well. That is one. It comes with this inbuilt suction as well. In case we are still unable to uh, access that area, know where the esophagus is, where should I be going further? And it is extending right inside the esophagus. As Dr. Uh, Sandhu said, less is better, but sometimes you cannot leave it because it's going all the way in, and you know I'm going to leave it behind, almost a lot of it will be left behind. There is an option which is there of uh, going through the cervical esophagus to the neck, passing a tube up through the lumen of the esophagus and localizing where the esophagus is and thereafter going and coagulating around it. Right, thank you. Uh, so uh, do we have, uh, uh, we have some more time. Can we attend to some questions and then I have uh, uh, Dr. Mary to show one uh, small, uh, uh, interesting um, clip or uh, still pictures. Uh, if I may. If yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, I did put in a question there where I asked with regards to, you know, how uh, can I delay the first surgery if the child is asymptomatic, to which Deepak has def put in a sensible comment saying that uh, the first one definitely would be needed from the point of view of biopsy. So you might as well obviously clear that. So two things come to my mind because Karthik has said that you would need a biopsy. So if I have a child whom I have diagnosed as stage one, so my thought process is like this, it's stage one and I want to avoid multiple surgeries. I wait for it to stage three. But if you tell me that a biopsy is a must for me to confirm my diagnosis, that would mean that I need to go in immediately when I see that papillomatosis, take a biopsy, do as much of a clearance as I can, and then stage away the second part much later. So which is what in this now? Which would be a right way to think? So one of the panelists to answer, I'll just yeah. Uh, request. Yeah, please go ahead. I hope you got Seemab's question. Sure. Um, this is Karthik. I would say, um, Seemab, I, I don't think that a biopsy is necessary in every patient. I think it if you look and it's an obvious visual diagnosis, then it's done. You don't, okay. you don't need a biopsy. I think if and when you go in to treat, then a biopsy is probably a good idea for viral typing if possible. Um, but I, I don't think that you have to rush to do a biopsy or to, to operate for the sake of biopsy unless there's a concern, uh, as discussed earlier, by, you know, for vocal fold immobility or malignant transformation or something else like that. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. So I go back with the idea that it's a biopsy is not necessary. It's a clinical diagnosis. Am I right in thinking that? I, I would say so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Doctor, Thank you. May I uh, add a point? Yeah, yeah. Please. To yes. Simap. Simap, I have a little slightly different take. I would uh, 
always do a surgery the first time the patient came to me if the patient has not been biopsied earlier. Okay. Um, and this is because um, we've had, I, I mean, the norm is correct, I agree, but we've had situations, we had a gentleman who came from Kenya, it seemed like a carpet grade one, um, but it turned out, and it looked classically like a papilloma, we excised it, it was not a papilloma. Uh, the moral in that being, so it never recurred and he had a great voice. And then we had a second lady who came from down south with a history of renal transplant. She also had what seemed to be a papilloma. Voice was mildly hoarse. We operated on her and there was carcinoma in C2 with papilloma. She was our second case actually. So I think medical legally also and from patient perspective, even if it's a 1% or 0.5% chance, I think for that patient, it's 100%. So I would not send a patient back if they came the first time without a biopsy. I would definitely do it. And then your question said that, how do I decide every time when to do the surgery? And Dr. Ezi also asked a similar question. And so we have, after the first surgery, a detailed discussion with the patient that what are the problems the patient, the child is facing, or if it's an adult, the adult, is your voice serviceable? Do you think you want to carry on like this for a while? Are you able to come for a follow-up without too much inconvenience to you? We don't let the patient to go, go to grade three because we don't want a situation of an airway issue happening and that sudden dharadhan in the OT and pushing the tube in. So it's a judgment call in every patient, but I wouldn't wait for it to get to a three. But at the same time, I wouldn't do it like Kishore said, just because you see it. You know, you're not getting, you're not trying to give a beautiful larynx, but a serviceable larynx. No, but the minute you see it, you are going to go in to pick up a biopsy. That's only the first time the patient the comes time. to me. Only the first time. Yes. And then, and then I do a biopsy maybe every third surgery, not every surgery even. You know, Thank you, Seema, for your question and Nupu for your comments. Thank you. uh, sometimes, you know, when to time the surgery, one of our fellows, Dr. Deepa, is doing an ultrasound study of the larynx to see the obstruction um, to time the surgery. Uh, it's an ongoing study. Probably we'll know about it um, as and when she gets some more cases. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, meanwhile, there are a lot of questions. Uh, uh, anybody, uh, the panelists can see and answer if that's faster and quicker, because there are some uh, requests for some more videos. Let's see if there is time. I'll give them time. Uh, how much time is Robert, there? Robert, can I make a comment? Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, so I, I agree completely with Nupur. I think, you know, any kind of suspicious lesion in the larynx needs to be removed. And basically, the objective being one for knowing what we are looking at. Number two, for you know, uh, quantification, not exactly quantification, but characterizing what kind of lesion this is. And then, so typically, if it's a small lesion and we know that this is a papillomatosis, then we would actually inject just cytofovid. And uh, yes, biopsy is required, even if it is a small lesion, to know what exactly we are looking at. Maybe later on, if it is a proved case of a benign lesion, then maybe we can hold on, but otherwise it is required for characterization. Thank you, thank you. Can I just ask uh, one question? Can I also just mention something here? Uh, yeah. That uh, Dr. Nupur, what she said was perfectly correct. I mean, I agree with her totally, but I would say that there's a subtle difference between uh, what we do in a juvenile case and in an adult case. In an adult case, we'll definitely immediately head for a biopsy. In a juvenile case, I'm not so sure. Because, yeah, when you do the biopsy, you will be do doing the first uh, removal as well. So uh, the juvenile case, depending upon the patient's severity of disease, you would probably take it up only when the patient is in severe distress. And that's probably when you'll do the biopsy as well. In an adult, on the other hand, when the possibilities are many, we would definitely like to go in for a biopsy and removal as soon as possible. That's my opinion. Thank you. In the audience, we have some very experienced people who work a lot with these cases. Raj, uh, uh, would you have some comments, quick comments? Because we need to go back to questions. Can somebody unmute Rakesh? Uh, Dr. Rakesh is not to be seen. Uh, I okay. think he has left here. Uh, is uh, Dr. Izzy there? Would you like to say something? Izzy, no, he's not there. Okay, is um, uh, Dr. Mary? Yeah, Dr. Mary is there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can, uh, yeah. 
uh, what I would say is, I would agree with Dr. Nupur. To me, whether adult or child, the first time if I see a lesion, I would rather biopsy, even if it is going to be clinically, no, no doubt it is a papilloma, the very first time I would biopsy. How many that times do you have seen a cancer in a four-year-old or five-year-old child? Or, or pathology other than a papilloma in, in this typical looking uh, lesion? If I may, and we've seen TB laryngitis in a child. Uh, but uh, and the management, entirety. no, we've seen one which mimicked papilloma and uh, the treatment is so different. So I agree with you that if you're talking about numbers, in 100 cases, it may be that one. I just wanted to bring that point forward that for that patient, it would change everything. Right. Good. Uh, Mary, can you show your uh, papilloma of that uh, center slide just for? Uh, let me uh, just see how I am not. They said that the host can share in this. Yeah, one minute, one minute, one minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have to. It's very it. interesting okay. slide she has. Okay. I hope I'm able to. I'm not very savvy on all this. Okay. Your co host, Max. <laughs> okay, wait. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you see the slide? It's coming up. Yeah. No, yes. not it. Not it. Not it. This was uh, shared with me by my colleague who visited Africa on a holiday. No, we don't have it. We don't Can have your. No, no, Can not it. Oh, sorry. I'll tell the background. It was sent to me by by my friend and colleague, a colleague in my master's time. He had visited Mozambique, and on the third week of February 2020. And uh, if I'll just zoom the first, it's in, in a, it is in a hospital. I don't know. Can you see it now? No. Uh oh, no. Uh -oh I'm so sorry. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> uh, we won't be able to comment, ma'am. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have put it on my screen. Yeah, you have to share it. Uh, no, this is, you're using a mobile? You're using a mobile? Yes. Uh, no, I'm not sure how you can share with on the mobile. Dr. Ramil, you have it with you, no? Uh, it's also on the WhatsApp message that you've sent. I don't have it in the... Ah, yo, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize my... I'll computer. just see. Mobile also you can share, ma'am. Oh, what do I do? Will, I'm so sorry. You will, so have an option for, you will have an option for share screen? I did. I put that option only. Then uh, you, you, you just... Uh, uh, you just bring that uh, on your main screen. Yes, I did. Okay, wait. Let me see. I'll bring it to uh, Zoom back. Huh? Is it? Yeah. Hmm. So, are you sharing screen? I, uh, how do I put now? Google Drive, Dropbox. I... No, first you have to download, ma'am. It is downloaded and kept on my screen. I'm so okay. sorry I'm taking too much of your time. Basically, I just wanted to show you all. Yeah, Raman sir, you can uh, send it to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm just sending. Ah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Basically, I, I just want, while we are finishing this wonderful session, wonderful speakers, just to go back, we still have this problem. Send way you, about, well, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, way Thank above you. what we can even imagine. In, in a part of the world, I don't know whether anybody from there are listening or part of this webinar, I do not know. But uh, at the end of this webinar, I am going to try to contact the doctor in that hospital just to know their situation. Can you, uh, Dr. Raman, were you able to send? Just doing it. I've sent it. A lot. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, you can I, engage them in some other discussions, sir. I will yeah. uh, post that. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see the questions now. Uh, most of them have been answered. Uh, most of the discussion at the moment is on uh, the uh, various uh, views on biopsy. A lot of people agree for biopsy. And, uh, Deepa, do you find any interesting question which has not been answered up till now? Can I, can I make a comment, Raman? Oh, yeah, yeah, please, please. I can, I can understand what Mary is saying because 90% of our patients come from Africa. And I can tell you, it's a disaster there. So this is just for you know, younger colleagues here. If you have a child who comes to you with an airway problem, you know, forget about whether tracheostomy has to be done or not. He requires a tracheostomy. So we keep on saying that, you know, avoid a tracheostomy and this and that. But 
if you have a situation that is compromising the airway, unfortunately, we do not have a choice. Try to give him a safe airway, safe airway. So that's where I think, unfortunately, we will have to you know, give up on all these things that, okay, because these guys are coming from far off places. There is very, very limited medical sort of services available there. And by the time that actually the child comes to you, it is a catastrophe. So again, I mean, you know, to make this long story short, safe airway in children is a necessity. Right. So we have some more questions here. Uh, mitomycin, somebody has asked the role of mitomycin in this. Anybody wants to volunteer? Any of the panelists? Uh, Raman, can I? Yeah, yeah, please. So, so um, as such, I'm not a big fan of mitomycin. So uh, I'll come from there. But if you, even if you look at the way mitomycin works, I don't see it has a direct effect on the papilloma. So I don't think it has any role on the papilloma itself. Some people might believe that it might reduce scarring and stuff. So from that point of view, again, there's no study to show that it works. Um, that, that's my thought about mitomycin. The other thing, uh, some people have asked, like, what, what would be the intervals? How often do you uh, take these patients to the OR? And I think I agree with Nupur to say that I would definitely do my first scope, mainly because even if it looks grade one, you don't know what the progression of that disease would be. How can you let them into the community to say, come when you are in distress, correct? They have come to you already because they are symptomatic. So I would biopsy them. But what do, I, what do I do? How often do I take them back to the OR? At your first sitting, you sit down with the family and say, this is what it is. This can come back. This will come back. We don't know the frequency. At that point, you say, whenever you are symptomatic and these might be the symptoms, you come back. And at that point, you can uh, vary your uh, frequency of surgeries based on their symptoms. And there are patients who need um, surgery every week and there are patients who do, you do once and it clears off. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Mary, the stage is yours. Oh, uh, no. Uh, I, has it come on the screen now? Uh, it's come on the screen, yeah. Yeah. I know the first, uh, the above slide shows the name of the hospital. I don't know whether it's French or um, Kishore Portuguese. will be able to say Portuguese. Portuguese or French. Portuguese, okay. This is a center just for papilloma. And if you the way down, I've got two lists. That's just a single list on the same day, 16 cases, and all are papilloma larynx. See just, the numbers. See the number of cases, all papilloma larynx, papilloma larynx. Just a single day, it is really shocking. So I personally feel we have become a group, we are discussing, Excellent. maybe we should find out whether we can do anything to help them in any way to get down these numbers. That is all. I, mean, I personally am planning to contact them, but uh, I don't know among this how many are adults and children. I just couldn't understand from their posting. That is the only thing, but just to say, nevertheless, it is papilloma larynx and it is... There's one more sheet, I think. Yeah, one more sheet. Two of them. Two yeah. sheets, two sheets. Yeah, it's a two sheet. Yeah, this was, yeah, this was the second uh, thing. Second one. Second. Yeah, two yeah, of them. First sheet. This so is the first many cases. Thing. First sheet, second sheet, and then and the first is one is the name of the hospital. Yeah, 16 cases. Which country you said, ma'am? This is Mozambique. Mozambique and it's the okay. central hospital of Muporto. Okay. Muporto, it's a big hospital. Yeah. I have these pictures of the intra. Yeah. It's a fairly advanced center. Okay, pictures we, we have some here. friends uh, from Africa here. I see some uh, friends from uh, Kenya. You think, Dr. You, and you think one of them can speak out and then. Oh, uh, Dr. Yes. Krista Wachunga was there. He has left. Uh, yes, I saw one name there. That's all. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, uh, he was there. And who else was there? Ruth was there. Let me let us find out. Uh, Let's see if they can make what? a comment. Yeah, meanwhile, uh, you can uh, engage in other discussions, sir. Let yeah, me... there is a question from Dr. Jagdish Chinappa, uh, one of our uh, speakers. Uh, can you uh, unmute uh, Jagdish? Yeah, yeah he can Thank unmute you, Dr. himself, sir. Thank you, Dr. Raman. This is a question for Dr. Karthik and Dr. Deepak, if they are there. 
uh, what are the immunological correlates with uh, the papillomatosis ultimately this seems to be a disease which is affecting which is affecting only some children who are exposed to hpv mm -hmm. so is there any work being done on let's say hla types and the immunological response to the hpv virus any one of you can answer or both of you can answer one by one deepak karthik sure um this is karthik that's yeah. really such a that's a great uh, question i don't think there's much work going on on that right now unfortunately i'm not aware of any significant studies uh, or anybody really looking at that i think it's something that's been implied and discussed here and there but no formal study that i'm aware of it, it's a great point there are studies going on trying to culture patient specific rrp samples in vitro and target treatment accordingly so maybe that kind of links to that uh, sort of individualized medicine approach but from an immunologic perspective i don't think there's much right deepak yeah same thing i means i think there have there have been people who have looked tried to look at it but they haven't got to anywhere people have uh, looked at the uh, maybe there is some genetic predisposition uh, so people have taken uh, samples of the parent and the child and sent it off uh, but as far as i know there's not been any study uh, which uh, directly correlates to it and partly because it's a, it's a small sample we are looking at for it to become significant it becomes very uh, difficult unless we look at a bigger sample looking at all kinds of papilloma diseases and what happens to them and uh, thank you so much and uh, we have one doctor have a question here. sorry go ahead we have one doctor ngozi from uh, nigeria yeah there is a question from him uh, yeah uh, where there are no lasers and debrider available oh it's uh, no debrider available what options do we have because uh, request to me it's a question from nigeria you can uh, still do old style cold cold exactly in, uh, yes cold instruments and try to avoid the trick if possible let's see okay then we have uh, um the dish any more questions that uh, any of the panelists can see you can answer directly also it's open house dr it's Rakesh. Rakesh. i have a question if i may ask oh, uh, please please it's uh, like a classroom because we have uh, so many um, faculty here and there are a lot of questions regarding the registry um, yeah. so i was wondering whether we can have a little bit of discussion with uh, dr pralad your input and dr kapil and everyone's input as to because we tried through uh, i personally tried through the association of phono surgeons of india you may have got the email i tried to send yeah. to all but i got a zero is i mean almost a zero response so uh, pralad is so good with all this stuff is there anything you all can think about where we can really make a registry yeah we can uh, see we can move forward on that yes ma'am what i can do is i can create an online platform where everybody can enter data but That's they should be able to participate how do we get them to participate as a problem i uh, we can, uh, email to can send an email yeah yeah we can send an I email i did that response was very yeah. poor somebody <laughs> mentioned to me about creation of an app also yeah but the main thing is we need to somehow can you think of some way where the person would be keen to reply It, yeah, no, no, you need to get into high density areas. That is, Ames has got a lot of cases. Right. So to capture those people, big fish first. To begin with. The others will follow once you give credit for them for contributing case zero, case one, case two. So you need the initial mass from these places. I think yeah, that yeah. will we be a major. To, we will create a platform. You yeah. upload, you know, uh, data of few patients. Okay. I think once Pranav, we, you should get people from at least yeah, yeah. seven cities together, yes, yes. Uh, who have big loads, and if we can try and coordinate it. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, we'll try to do that. Certainly, we'll try to do that. That will be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We'll I'll look into that. Yeah. Pranav, you're one of those hmm. one of those few uh, people getting a job offer during the COVID time. <laughs> gratis <laughs> actually sir i feel uh, most of the most of the larger institutes already have their own registry this more of a, a concept of combining these registries to begin with 
I'm sure, uh, I mean, yes. like Ames Delhi or uh, Mams Hospital, they will all be already having their own registries. We have our own. So first, we get these two, all of these together. Then we can go ahead from there and add on. Yes, good idea. So do we have Rakesh back, or uh, he's a person oh, with immense experience? No, not there. Shashi, there is there. Rakesh. Is... Shashi, okay, Shashi, the hidden figures. Yeah, yeah Shashi is here. One minute, okay, Shashi is here. He has raised his hand also. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shashi, welcome. So, we missed you last time. Yeah. Hi. Yes. So last hi. Yes, welcome. Session. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful session. We didn't really. Uh, I missed a bit, but uh, the discussion far uh, complete. Everything was good. I, I just wanted to make a comment. How we can get procure a vaster? It's from the chemo colleagues because our dose for intralesional is not more than three to six milligram. So. Uh, th- for the last five patients which we were doing, so the chemo guides, whenever they have their chemo schedules, we would sync our patients with their schedules. So uh, when their drug is prepared, this is just a little dose which they used to give us for free. So all the treatment of 40, 50,000 injection costs would just reduce to zero for us. And we have had time we have a problem with the link. Yeah, so, uh, Shishi, we lost your voice. You like, uh, could you please uh, repeat? No. Okay, we'll get Suja in. Suja, any comments? Can you unmute Suja? Yeah, yeah, yeah Suja. No. Uh, Shashi's net is very bad. Ooh. No, no, no. Yeah, Suja is online, sir. Yeah, Suja? Uh, yes, yes. I had a question for Dr. Nupur. Uh, I wanted to know what is the practical application of using NBA in papillomatosis? Dr. Nupur? Uh, unmute, unmute, no good. Sorry, yes, she can unmute that. herself. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Suja, thanks for the question. Uh, when we have the really bulky papilloma uh, and it's filling up everything, I don't think too much of a role. But when we do, when we have scattered papillomas, then in the office we do tend to use the NBI so that it really helps in picking up small spots which you may miss. In surgery, what I do is after doing the debulking, if I feel there is a doubt, then I use the Spectra A system, which is there on the Spice camera, which works similar as the NBI. And that can also help in picking up small areas. But having said that, I think, uh, Suja, not a very dramatic role because papilloma is not a disease you're taking out microscopically. You cannot. So even if you leave tissue behind, which the, the eye through the microscope cannot see, and you're trying to get it through Zoom and with the Spectra A or the NBI, uh, you know, it's not that you've achieved a great deal because even the normal mucosa has got uh, HPV infection. So, you know, I don't think it has a, a really astounding role in improving the quality of life or your treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions in the audience quickly before we wrap up? Uh, One question to all the speakers and, of course, the panelists. Uh, Do we have your permission to upload this on the YouTube because it becomes a permanent uh, resource material for people who are learning? If you say yes, thank you so much, Nupur. And uh, the other speakers also, if you give your content, we'll put it up and, uh, you know, it will be seen by more people. And today's discussion was, uh, I think, to me at least, it was A+, plus or A++. It was fantastic. And uh, other thing, I need to thank the speakers because we always encourage them to talk to each other. There's not too much overlap in the topics. And of course, the panelists with, for their wise um, comments, which enrich the whole thing. Um, last but not the least, of course, um, is, is the um, uh, Dr. Tripti who came out with this wonderful uh, presentation. And all this wouldn't have been possible without the wonderful audience. And of course, Prahlad to support us. Prahlad, thank you so much. And I call this pediatric otolaryngology an orphan speciality. Thank you for giving us parenthood. And the next week program, sir? We'll uh, 
Uh, we have one, but I may have to have one of the speakers who spoke today again next week. So we'll try to do something else next week. Okay. By tomorrow, we'll decide uh, once I identify the speakers. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is every Sunday and uh, going from uh, simple to complex, uh, basic to advanced. So we have permission to post this uh, video on YouTube as well as uh, this chat also on the website. Because today the chat was very interesting. You know, we had uh, a very good uh, this thing discussion yes. on the chat. Like, you know, that itself can be a great resource uh, for uh, beginners particularly. It was a parallel webinar going. Yeah, yeah. I uh, thank the panelists, um, Dr. Bikram Chaudhary, Dr. Deepak, um, Dr. Kartik, Dr. Kishore, who took time off and joined us, and also all the speakers. Thank you so much. Kapil, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Prahlad. Yeah.